bid welcome on this fifth Sunday in Easter to our service of spiritual communion at the Church of the Good Shepherd in downtown Raleigh, North Carolina. I am the Reverend Joyce Corbin Cunningham, the Associate Rector of this community of faith. And on behalf of the rector whom you will be hearing from, she will be our preacher today. We welcome you. And so now I invite you to just sit back and take some deep breaths and get in touch with the spirit that is the life force from our God. Alleluia! Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia! Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Acts. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? 
Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Here ends the reading. Psalm 22. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone, all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. A reading from the first epistle of John. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God who they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Here ends the epistle.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory, Glory to, to you, you, Lord Christ. Christ. Jesus to, said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bear fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I and them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. I speak to you in the name of the living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This week is one of those singular times where the real heft of our readings, you might say, doesn't come this morning from the gospel though that is a fabulous reading about Jesus being, you know, the vine, we the branches, and so on and so forth. But in fact, it almost seems that the center of the lectionary gravity, as it were, is in our first reading, which comes from the book of Acts and is most colloquially referred to as Philip and the eunuch. It is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And it has this wealth of spiritual, scriptural fodder. So you could really go in any number of directions. And part of the reason I think that I love it is because everything happens all between verse 26 and verse 40. Philip sets off in a new direction he and the other disciples have been going around spreading the word of Jesus' death, resurrection, and salvific love in the world. And an angel of the Lord shows up to Philip in a dream and says, go this way. And he goes and he finds this fascinating human. And before you know it, he's asking to get baptized and then in the moment that he comes out of the water, Philip's whisked off, and this person, this newly baptized member of the body of Christ, we're told, doesn't miss a beat. He goes off rejoicing. A beginning, a middle, an end. I love it. So we could talk about baptism, what on earth this has to say about, as Jesse was referring to on Good Shepherd Sunday, the one flock that includes people from lands like Ethiopia and different cultures and different backgrounds. 
We could talk about how maybe this encounter between Philip and the eunuch is a sort of blueprint of what evangelism, hold on to your hats, could look like. All the introverts among us probably terrified of the idea of accosting somebody on their travels in the middle of their reading time. Nowadays, it would probably be on their phone. But at any rate, we could say this is the how to get more members in church. But I'm reminded of a little illustration I saw not too long ago and I sent to my husband. Because, you know, the aphorism is, oh, it's not about, you know, the destination, it's about the journey. And this little picture that I saw, it had a picture of a panda and it had a teeny dragon on top of the panda and they were walking around. And one of them said to the other, what's more important? Is it the journey or the destination? And the other one replies, the company. And for whatever reason, when I hear this reading from Acts in this particular moment, what I feel like it typifies most to me and what I find the spirit unearthing is not so much um, about baptism per se or about how to spread the word and get more people in church, but it most speaks to me of what Bible study is like. Some of our Bible studies have continued to meet during this pandemic time. Mother Nancy Allison continues to host hers on Tuesdays in the morning and in the evening. And then recently, we've started to be able to have the Wednesday morning Bible study even in person. Some of these opportunities you may not even know exist, and we're gonna do a better job of getting that word out, and you'll see something in the newsletter this week about it, in case you wanna join, or in case you wanna help us start a new one altogether. But when I think about the Bible studies that I have been a part of, yes, there is the sitting together and opening scripture and being open ourselves to what God might say. But what I most remember is the quality of the interactions between the people that are there. I remember these little communities almost, and I don't say little in a diminutive sense. I remember one where we could never go through one Bible study without someone raising in some form or fashion the question of why do bad things happen to good people? And so part of what I love and part of what speaks to me in this interaction of Philip and the eunuch is that we bring all of our life to these conversations. That's what's so enriching to me about Christian discipleship is that we do it together and we learn to share life together and yes, you can talk about what does this verse mean and where does the Greek come from but in between the lines, you'll hear about other people's lives. You'll hear about the things that really matter to them and the precious ways that God has shown up or that God seems to have let them down. And that seems to make those conversations as much holy ground as the holiness of whatever scriptural passage you're talking about. And so I love that when Philip comes alongside this person, he doesn't have an elevator speech. He doesn't have a pitch. It's not the three points in his pocket of, you know, why you should come and be on my team. It's a question. And presumably he asks it in such a way that doesn't make him seem like a pompous, condescending so-and-so. But he says, do you understand what you're reading? And by goodness, if the answer that comes back isn't in the same vein, another question. How could I without somebody to help me? That's what we do 
as siblings in Christ. We bring our questions to one another. They get deeper and stranger the long that they, the long they sit in us and the long that we live. They change from when we're teenagers to when we enter different seasons of life. But we ask them together. We ask them of scripture, we ask them of God. And we spend time together doing that so that our interactions are not just when there's a fire that needs to be put out, but this rhythm of life that we have together. And presumably by the time Philip and this unnamed newly baptized person part, yes, they're not gonna be this new little church community, the two of them themselves, but presumably they each are gonna go out and they're gonna foster that kind of community, that kind of company that they've provided to one another in this singular experience. And when we hear these words from the Acts of the Apostles alongside the words from 1 John, we might have some pause. We might say, well, you know, am I to study the Bible? Am I to spend time with other people in a faithful way on a regular basis because it makes me a better Christian? Am I to spend time with other people so that somehow there'll be some utilitarian need that's fulfilled by that activity. It's going to help me live with better values. It's going to help me learn more of the content of the Bible so that I can get it under my belt. Maybe so. Maybe I really am the average of the five people I most hang out with. In which case, maybe going to a Bible study, maybe spending time with the questions of my life outside of worship with other people, whether it's on Zoom or in person, you know, maybe it'll raise the average of the company that I'm keeping and help me aspire to better living, to more faithful living. And what I love about 1 John is that glorious verse that says, in this is love. Not that we loved God, not that we went to Bible study or worship or got baptized at the right time or the wrong time, but that God first loved us. And what that says to me is that this God loved this person who took care of the treasury of a queen. God loved that person just as much after that person was baptized as God did before. And God loved Philip just as much before he had heeded the words of the angel and gone down that deserted path that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. God loved Philip just as much before that as God did by the time he stood in the water, having baptized this new follower, this new Christian. So our practices, whether they're of worship, of prayer, of study, hopefully, if anything, because we're a community, they help us be accountable. They give us a reason to be together that if we were trying to live faithfully on our own, we might have a much harder time keeping that kind of a rhythm going under our own steam. But they're not so that God will love us better or more. We might think with the gospel passage today that perhaps somehow God will abide in us more the more stuff we manage to get done of a religious kind. And yet, I think there is a relationship, but it's a little different than that. And that is, those pieces that we have 
whether it's once a week, whether it's once a month, whether it's when God gives us the grace and the brain cells and the awakeness and the time to go off to a deserted place. This road that Philip goes down, the NRSV, this translation we use, talks about it as the wilderness road. It's a bit less poetic than that. It's an uninhabited place. And it's the same word that's used in the Gospels when they talk about Jesus going to a deserted place to pray. We go off to those places and maybe worship is one of them. Not so that we can somehow abide more fully than other people in the love of God, but rather to be reminded that that love is the water we are swimming in all the time. It's the air that we are breathing all the time. And there is nothing that you and I can do to ever stop us from abiding in that God and in that love. And so when we talk about Christian community, when I think about all the possibilities that I truly hope are opening up for us, to be together safely, to have that hunger in our hearts met through God and through one another in the rich company that Jesus offers to us in each other. I very much think of the fact that what we are inviting one another to do more and more is not to buy some new kind of product we're not to sell the faith that we have to other people. We're to share it. We're to realize that there's such a gift. And the more deeply we become acquainted with that real love in the world, the more we're surrounded by people who faithfully wrestle with the questions of life and the love of God together, the more we can truly be and do what Jesus asks and instructs, which is to bear much fruit and become disciples. Amen. And now I invite you to stand as you are able as we recite the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, and in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life in the world to come. Amen. Blessed are you, eternal God. To be praised and glorified forever. Hear us as we pray for the unity of the church. May we all be one that the world may believe. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That the life of Christ may be revealed in us. We remember those who have died. Loving God, into your hands we commend them. We praise you for all your saints who have entered into your eternal glory. May we also come to share your heavenly kingdom. We commend to your care all those who have asked for our prayers. And I invite you to say these names with me, especially Roy, Roy Wright, Wright, Fran Hawk, Hawk Paul Hawk, Hawk Mike Webb, Webb, Emily Brown, Eileen Wood, Ella Wood, Ann Sanders, Sanders Carol, Ed Barnes, Barnes Janet, Janet Gilliam, Carolyn Owens, Owens Reggie Fuller, Fuller, Susan Linscott, and the Linscott family, Miles Hobble, Chris Novak, Deanna Hill, Carolyn Beard, Wilma Miller, Hal Miller, Chris Yetter, Emily Olick, Helene Bullen, Elena Sved, Susan Newton, Elizabeth Sis Shetcher, Helen Salmon, the family of Cameron Elliott, Sophie Allen, Catherine Williams, Bob Williams, Maggie Danielle Peterson, Barbara Schweitzer, Ronnie Thompson, and Yella Ridge. Have compassion on those who suffer from sickness, grief, or trouble. In your presence may they find strength. Look with your kindness on our homes and families. Grant that your love may grow in our hearts. Make us alive to the needs of our community. Help us to share one another's joys and burdens. Inspire and lead those who hold authority in the nations of the world. Guide us and all people in the way of justice and peace. Strengthen all who minister in Christ's name. Give us courage to proclaim your gospel. We pray in silence for our own needs. God, our hope, may your blessing empower our thanksgivings and our prayer. For we put our trust in you, the living God, risking disappointment, risking failure, working and waiting expectantly for the coming of your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let us lift up our hearts in praise and thanks to God, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, 
who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. join our voices together as we continue praying the prayer for spiritual communion. In union, O Lord, with the faithful at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I present to you my soul and body with the earnest wish that I may always be united to you. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all the love of my soul. Let nothing ever separate me from you. May I live in you and may you live in me in this life and the life to come. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, my sisters and brothers, may the God of peace who has brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you forever. Amen.
let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs>